Okay, so let's continue. Now that we've covered uh, topology in some detail, you should be aware th that this is not a comprehensive set of topologies. There's a lot more, and as I said, topologies are being developed uh, even right now, even in 2018. Uh, but now we can move on to routing. That's the second big aspect of uh, interconnection networks. How do you route things? Uh, so routing means sending a message from one place to another, right? And routing mechanism could be uh, done in different ways. So one is called arithmetic routing. Basically, how do you determine the destination? Uh, uh, and you can use simple arithmetic to determine the route in regular topology. If your topology is regular, you can designate each node by an x coordinate and y coordinate and maybe a z coordinate also, right? And you use simple arithmetic to determine where to go next. That's right? called dimension order routing in meshes or tori, which we'll take a look at. You basically go through the x-axis first and then the y-axis next, and then the message goes from, again, x-axis first and y-axis next. It's called xy routing also, but you could also do yx routing. It could be source-based, meaning source specifies the output port for each switch in the route. Uh, basically, here you have the source, you have the destination. As opposed to each router doing arithmetic to calculate where to send the message next, the source says, okay, you should go through this route. At the beginning, when you actually send the message, you also send a header saying, okay, these are the routers that you should follow. It's called source-based routing. Clearly, the disadvantage is you have a bigger header right now, but the advantage is so switches are simple. There is no control state. Uh, you ju they just look at the header of the packet and they say, okay, I'm gonna send it to this one next. And then they strip off that one because nobody else needs that information anymore. Of course, the downside is large header, right? Especially in large networks. And the question is, how do you do the source-based routing, right? You need to find a good route to begin with. Here, this is good and easy for dynamic switching. Also, table lookup based, basically, you index into the table for output port. Internet works a lot this way uh, today. Uh, it's table lookup based. The upside is there's no need for a header. It's more flexible than arithmetic, clearly. And it's useful for irregular topologies where you can, you don't have coordinates, for example. If you don't have coordinates, then you use this one. But switches are more complex because you need to look up a table right now to figure out where to go. Okay, so that's the routing mechanism. This is, I call it the mechanism because this is kind of how you determine the next place to send a message to. But there's also an algorithm uh, that's different, that governs different things. And there are three types of routing algorithms. One is deterministic. Basically, the deterministic algorithm always chooses the same path for a communicating source and destination pair. If you're going from this node to this node, you always go through the same path, deterministic. Uh, oblivious means you can choose different paths and you're oblivious to the network state. Basically, from this node to this node, you can take this path, this path, this path, this path, but you're oblivious to what's happening in any of those paths. And the adaptive is you can also, you can choose still different paths, but you adapt to the state of the network. Your choice depends on what's happening in each of those paths or what you think is happening in each of those paths because you may not always know, right? Especially in a large network. So these are three fundamental routing algorithms. Uh, and uh, how do you adapt? So if you actually have an adaptive algorithm, how do you adapt to the network state? You can have local feedback or global feedback in terms of the congestion that you're experiencing in different parts of the network. How do you collect that feedback becomes also important. Local feedback meaning you look at uh, this router only. Global feedback meaning you look at the entire network state or portions of the network state. There's also, you can have minimal or non-minimal paths. Adaptive routing can be, so from source to destination, you can have multiple minimal paths. What is the minimal path? Minimal number of hops that you need to go through. And in a mesh, if you think about it, there are at least two minimal paths, right? You can go from, X, Y, or Y, X, and that gives you two minimal paths. Which one do you choose depends on uh, the local and global feedback potentially. But you can also have easily non-minimal paths as we discussed in mesh, right? You can actually have many, many paths. You could circle around the network many times and then go to your destination, right? Minimal path routing restricts you because you can only go through two paths if you want to be minimal. Non-minimal actually, it increases your adaptivity because you're not that strict in your routing, you can say, okay, I don't care about minimal or non-minimal as long as I get to my destination reasonably fast. This way you can actually exploit path diversity better. And we're gonna talk about that. 
whenever you do non-minimal routing, you, ha you, you need to be very careful. You need to ensure that you're making progress to your destination, right? So non-minimal paths can lead to live lock issues in the network. OK, uh, so let's talk about deterministic routing. All packets between the same source destination pair take the same path. Uh, the classic example of this is dimension order routing. Basically, you order the dimensions. You first traverse dimension x and then traverse dimension y. It's called xy routing. It's used in Cray T3D, for example, and many on-chip networks because it's really simple. It also is deadlock free, which is a good example, a uh, good benefit of it. Because there's no cycles in resource allocation. If we get to that, we're going to talk about deadlock also. Because if you actually have cycles in resource allocation, you may actually run into a state where all of the buffers are occupied. And you need to place this packet in a buffer, but there's no buffer that's available. So you run into deadlock. And you cannot move in the network. So if you're not careful in your routing algorithm, you can run into deadlock in the network. And people have developed a lot of different theories for, to get rid of that deadlock. XY is nice because. It basically, because of the way it operates, you go through one dimension first and next dimension uh, after that, and you cannot have a cycle. There is no way you can form deadlock uh, in, a, uh, in, uh, uh, in, in any pattern, basically, uh, because the, you, your routing algorithm restricts uh, uh, where, where the packets can go. OK, so downside of dimension order routing is it's actually terrible for uh, if you have a mesh uh, network it really doesn't exploit the path diversity of the mesh, right? Mesh actually has many connections from this node to this node, but you're only exploiting one. That's it, and you're very strict about it. So it could lead to high contention as a, as a result of this because it doesn't exploit path diversity. These are actually connected to each other. Because everybody, so let's assume that you're at the x route over here and then the y route over here. Let's assume that all, uh, mm, all of the nodes over here are sending a request to the memory controller over here, then everybody's contending on the same path, basically, even though you have many, many other paths in the network that are completely unutilized. OK, so in general, this is not good because it's not using the bandwidth of the entire network. OK, so deadlock, I guess I have a slide on it. Basically, deadlock means no forward progress. It's caused by circular dependencies on resources. Basically, in this example, each packet waits for a buffer occupied by another packet downstream. So if you look at this example over here, uh, let's see. I should start from somewhere. This packet is waiting for this resource over here. It needs to be routed over here. It cannot go because this resource is occupied by another packet. And that packet is waiting for this resource over here. It cannot go because that resource is occupied by another packet. This packet is waiting for this resource over here. It cannot go because this resource is occupied by another packet. And this packet is waiting for this resource over here. It cannot go because now we have completed the circle. This packet is waiting for this resource. It cannot go. So we have the cycle over here. And this is happening because this doesn't happen in XY routing because, first of all, XY routing says you go X and Y. So you cannot go Y and X, as you can see. So by definition, you cannot have this sort of uh, mm, uh, waiting for resources. You cannot have the circular dependency. So how do you get rid of deadlock? Basically, one is avoiding cycles in routing. And this, uh, this is happening over here because we didn't avoid the cycles in routing. If, if we had XY routing, we wouldn't, some packets wouldn't be going this way. Uh, basically, you can do dimension order routing. You cannot build a circular dependency on the resources if you do XY or YX routing. Right? Basically, this is called restricting the turns each packet can take. You have restricted whether a packet can, tur can turn uh, this way or that way. Okay. Or you could avoid deadlock by adding more buffering. For example, if you actually had some escape buffers over here, you could say, OK, I reserve these in, under these conditions, and maybe you escape that way. There are issues related to this, but you could potentially handle it this way. Uh, or you could detect and break deadlock. You could potentially uh, have some mechanism that detects this situation. And it's possible to do that. Deadlock detection is actually not that easy, but it's possible. Once you detect it, you basically say, let's say I'm going to drop this packet and then ask the sender to resend it if you have those mechanisms in the network. You could do that. That way you can free resources and you can continue. It's usually better if your routing algorithm doesn't, uh, is deadlock free. That way you don't need to deal with situations like this because some of these situations may be very bad to deal with. If you can drop packets, that actually helps, certainly. Once in a while, maybe in the, in the worst case, if you, don't, if you detect really slow progress, you, stop, you start dropping packets, right? That's another way of handling deadlock. 
uh, without detecting the de deadlock. Okay, so basically, uh, this, this, is a, this is one of the seminal papers that talk about uh, adaptive routing, and they develop a model of turn. What they do is they analyze directions in which packets can turn in the network. They determine the cycles that such turns can form and prohibit just enough turns to break possible cycles. And that's how they design a deadlock-free uh, routing algorithm. And XY is actually one way of doing it, but XY is very restrictive, actually. You can be much, more, much higher throughput than XY uh, by, by following something like this. But if you're really interested, you can take a look at that. Okay, let's go into oblivious routing. Oblivious routing is the classic example of this is Valiant's algorithm, Leslie Val developed by Leslie Valiant. Basically, the goal was to develop, balance the network load. You have this huge network, and you want to balance the load across the network. Uh, and the idea is very simple. It's a randomized algorithm. You randomly, ch uh, if you're sending a packet from this place to this place, you don't directly send a packet with some routing algorithm. You randomly choose an intermediate node first. You first send it to that node, and then go from that node to that node, uh, the destination. That's the idea. And between source and intermediate and intermediate and destination, you could use dimension order routing, for example, to be deadlock free. Or you could use some other routing algorithm. Right? Uh, but the nice thing over here is if you randomly choose a node, you're really balancing the load across the network, but, uh, which is the goal of the algorithm. It's non-minimal, which means that packet latency can increase, even if you may not have load. Right? You may not have any load, then you're still going through this randomized thing. So, uh, you could actually optimize this. You could do this on high load. If your network is congested, then you say, okay, I'm going to switch to this. That may or may not be good because that may actually increase the congestion in the network also. Or you restrict the intermediate node to be close in the same quadrant. Then you utilize your network links nicely. And you don't necessarily increase your packet latency to be very large. Uh, right. So actually, you can play tricks uh, with this. So it's, a, it's actually an interesting idea. So adaptive routing is the most adaptive thing that looks at uh, the network state. The router uses the network state. For example, it gets information from a downstream buffer, downstream router, its occupancy. And it basically picks which productive output port uh, to, uh, to send the packet to. This is a minimal adaptive, so there are two forms. Minimal adaptive meaning you don't change the uh, hop count. Uh, you don't increase the hop count uh, to be non-minimal. So you always pick a productive output port, meaning port that gets the packet closer to its destination. Right? And in, mesh, in a mesh, for example, if you're going from one place to another place, there are always two productive output ports. You can go from the x dimension, and you can always go for, uh, from the y dimension. Right? And minimal means that you pick one of those output ports, and whenever you're deciding, you basically have an understanding of the congestion over here and congestion over here, and you pick the one that has less congestion. How do you get informed about that congestion? Basically, routers once in a while collect information and send it back to each other, and that, that increases a lot of, increase more, add more, adds more traffic to the network, of course. But you could, you could use a back network for that purpose. So this is a way of local congestion in this case, uh, and minimality restricts achievable link utilization in this case, right? Basically, you're minimal. As a result, you're not, again, utilizing a lot of the links. You're not saying, okay, I'm going from here to here, I'm going to go back. That is non-minimal. Basically, it's also called misrouting. Basically, if you're non-minimal, uh, it's also called fully adaptive, uh, uh, meaning you're not restricted to pick a productive output port. You can pick a non-productive output port that gets you farther away from the destination. With the goal of eventually you're going to circle back and get to your destination. And you can do that based on the network state. That gives you more flexibility. Now you're, us you're using your network in a much better manner uh, in terms of load balance, right? These links may be unutilized. If you if maybe you have a lot of con con contention on this side, but if you go around this way, you actually get to your destination better. The, downs uh, the upside is you get better network utilization and load balance. The downside is you need to now guarantee live lock freedom because you cannot keep misrouting forever, right? How do you ensure that the packet eventually gets to its destination? So non-minimal algorithms are actually usually good. They sometimes turn the deadlock problem into live lock problems. And regardless, you need to solve both problems. OK. So more in adaptive routing. This is actually interesting because adaptive routing is a more general thing. You can avoid faulty links and routers. You can route around faults. 
deterministic routing cannot actually handle faulty components in its strictest form. Uh, of course, if you want to route around faults, you need to change the routing table to disable faulty routers, and this is usually done assuming that you detect the faulty Lincoln router. And we've been doing work in this area. This is actually a really interesting topic because it's not, uh, you need to do multiple things in a network. You need to have low overhead. Actually, you want to be fully distributed in general, and you want to have guaranteed delivery. And how do you design a routing algorithm for that? If you're interested in that, you can take a look at this. Okay, that's routing. Now let's talk about buffering and flow control. Any questions on routing? Okay. There's a lot to talk about buffering and flow control. Let's try to limit what we talk about. So recall that we talk about circuit and packet switching. Uh, there is implications on buffering and flow control over here, as you can see. Let's look at pa packet switch networks. So packet switch networks, you switch packets. So a packet looks like this. You have a header that c contains routing and control information, and you have a payload, carries data, and can be further divided, and you can, have, you can have an error code such that you check whether you received the right thing uh, by computing a hash on the, header, uh, on the payload and checking if the checksum or whatever hash matches. Uh, anyway, so actually there are uh, two packets. Uh, um, uh, we're going to look at packets. Uh, if you have two packets and the router is dynamically trying to uh, handle the connection, contention, if the packets are requesting the same port, what do you do? This is actually very fundamental. You have multiple choices over here. This packet wants to go this way. This packet wants to go the same way. How do you handle that connection, uh, contention? Three choices. One is buffer one and let the other one go. The other one is drop one. And the other one is misroute one. Right. These are three fundamental choices. You can combine all of them together also. This is called deflection. Uh, dropping one, of course, uh, there are implications now, right? If you do the buffering, you need to have a buffers. And you need to have enough buffers. You need to communicate the availability of the buffers to the senders. So you have buffer management overhead. If you do the dropping, that's good. You may get rid of the buffers. Uh, but now you need to ensure that the packet gets resent by someone. So you need to communicate to the sender that you dropped their packet. If you miss out one, you don't need to communicate anything to anyone. That's good. But you need to have some place to misroute it, first of all. If all of the links are busy, you cannot misroute it. So what do you do in that case? Well, your network topology needs to allow you to misroute. Uh, and of course, once you misroute, you run into this live lock issue that we'll talk about. So there are clearly trade-offs between these. And we're going to examine, uh, especially misrouting soon, because this is something that has not been examined as much. The mindset in interconnection networks for a while was everything has to be buffered. And we're going to challenge that mindset. OK, so there are many flow control methods. Uh, let's see which ones I want to really talk about. But circuit switching is one, as we've discussed. Bufferless, packet or flit based, store and forward, virtual cut through, wormhole. There are other ones also. So circuit switching, let's take a look at this one. Uh, resource allocation granularity is very high in circuit switching. Basically, you allocate full switches for a path, right? You pre-allocate the resource across multiple switches for a given flow. You need to send a probe to set up the path for pre-allocation, as we've discussed. No need for buffering. That's great. No contention. Flow performance is isolated. That's good for isolated performance. You can handle arbitrary message sizes. Basically, you can think of it as a long link between the source and the destination that's formed. Now, downside is long link, isolated link. Nobody else can use those links. Uh, so two flows cannot use the same link lower link utilization, and you have handshake overhead to set up a circuit. So a bufferless deflection routing, which we're going to talk about, uh, this actually developed uh, in this 1962 paper, and we re-examined the idea more recently. Uh, basically, you have packets. You never buffer them in the network. When two packets contend for the same link, you deflect one. Basically, these two packets, they go to the same destination. You have no buffers in the network. You don't like dropping. So what do you do? You let one to go to its destination and you let the other one take the scenic route. And eventually it gets to its destination. And you inject new traffic whenever there is a free output link, uh, which is good. Otherwise, you don't inject. Because you, know, you have no buffers. You cannot inject arbitrarily. You just sense output links. And if there is no traffic, you just inject. And mm, this is what a buffered router looks like, actually. You have these input buffers. You could also have output buffers. But we're going to look at this, uh, this in a little bit. Uh, basically, you, you buffer the packet in, in pipeline latches and on network links. Basically, you get rid of 
this, but this complicates the deflection routing logic as we will talk about later. Okay, so issues in bufferless deflection routing, you have live lock issues, you have a router complexity as a result. Even though you get rid of buffers, this becomes complex actually, especially to, if you want to handle the live lock in, the, in some way. Uh, and you have performance and congestion issues at high loads. The good thing about buffering is it gives you uh, flexibility. You can keep injecting to the network as long as your buffers uh, are not full, you can still handle things. But if you don't have buffers, you cannot keep injecting into your network. So I'm going to talk about some of these things that uh, we've been doing some work on. Okay, so there's different flow control methods. One is packet-based flow control, basically. Uh, you, you have store and forward, that's one sort of network. You basically you copy the packet entirely into the network router before moving to the next node. Flow control unit is at the entire packet. This is usually not a good idea. This leads to high per packet latency. It requires buffering for the entire packet in each node. So this is actually usually not employed, so I'm not going to talk about it. So this packet, basically what you do is, Flow control unit is the packet, meaning that you decide to send this packet after this packet is fully here. And once you send this packet, you send it, and this router doesn't send anything from this packet until the entire packet is received over here. So not a good idea. It's very slow. And also it requires buffering. So can we do better? Yes, you can do better. It's cut through is an, another example. Basically, you start forwarding as soon as the header is received and resources are allocated. So again, this is also packet-based. You have a huge reduction in latency, but you still need to allocate buffers and channel bandwidth for full packets. So basically it looks like this. Packets get distributed, but uh, you still need to allocate full buffers. And if the packets are large, this doesn't work nicely. Okay, so what do you do if the output port is blocked? I'm going through it relatively fast. Basically, you let the tail continue when the head is blocked, absorbing the whole message into a single switch. So this requires a buffer large enough to hold the largest packet. That's not a good idea, which means that it degenerates the store forward with high contention. So can we do better? So wormhole flow control was developed to do better. It's basically a worm that's distributed across different routers. You, you basically break the packet into smaller flits, flow control units. It's the buffer and bandwidth allocation unit, basically. Flits are sent across the fabric in a wormhole fashion. Basically, you have a header, body follows the head, and then tail follows the body in a pipeline manner. If head is blocked, the rest of the packet stops, and routing information is only in the head, only in the header, basically. Only the header determines the route, everything else follows. And then header, uh, once you determine the route uh, based on the header, you basically say, leave, leave a trace saying that, oh, everything else should go this way. And once the tail comes, it goes that way and clears the router. That's the idea. Well, I just said that. How does the body tail know where to go? You basically leave breadcrumbs behind and the tail eats the breadcrumbs so that the router becomes free at the end. So it's a worm going through the, the network. And latency is almost independent of the distance for long messages. It, it's this way because you're pipelining entire network. So the, uh, clearly this is lower latency and you get more efficient buffer utilization over store and forward. There are limitations because this suffers from head of line blocking. If the head flip cannot move to due to contention, another worm cannot proceed even though links may be idle. So the best way of looking at it is, is something like this. Let me see. Basically, uh, both of these things want to go to one. So as you can see, this is input port one, uh, input port two, output port one, output port two. And these are the output ports these different packets want. Head of line blocking is, these are five for queues. That's the key here, first in, first out. Uh, head of line blocking means the heads both want to go to one. So as a result, one of them wins, but you cannot utilize this output port because none of the heads want to go to output port two. Right. So what is the solution to this? Well, if you're designing processors, you would say this is a stupid way to design. You do out of order processing, right? That is true. Well, that is one solution. But people in uh, switch design didn't like out of order processing. They basically wanted to uh, minimally change the switch five for Q over here uh, such that you reduce the impact of this head of line blocking without going resorting into fully out of order execution or out of order scheduling in these input queues. So you don't want to, you still want to preserve the benefits of five for queues. It's actually a very different mindset uh, in, in computer, uh, in, in processor design, you think of out of order processing, okay, okay, that's the baseline. And how do we simplify it? Maybe you add some five for queues. 
here the mindset starts from, we start from five OQs, and how do we actually make it a little bit better such that we get the benefits all out of order? Okay, so basically you leave this idle, and this was subject to head of line blocking. If you did out of order scheduling, this problem wouldn't, this problem wouldn't be there basically. Okay, so basically a worm can be before another uh, in the router input buffer due to the FIFO nature, the second worm cannot be scheduled even though it may need access to another output port. So this is another example. Here, you're blocked by other packets over here, you cannot move. The blue one, the buffer is full, blue cannot proceed over here. And because blue cannot proceed, this red cannot proceed over here, even though it's going to somewhere completely different. Right? This makes no sense. Uh, in a sense, because you're, you're really, ha you're really, the problem is five OQs. So this channel is idle, red packet is behi blocked behind the blue one, but it cannot go because it's uh, subject to head of line blocking. And red holds this channel and channels remain idle until uh, the read proceeds over here because of wormhole routing. So because of wormhole routing and this head of line blocking uh, and FIFO buffers, you have a problem. So what is the solution? The solution was developed in the seminal paper. Again, as I said, one solution is out of order scheduling, but people didn't want that. So they wanted to actually have multiple FIFO queues, basically multiplex multiple channels over one fin physical channel. You divide up the input buffer into multiple buffers sharing a single physical channel. Physical channel is basically a single input port. That's the idea. And this is one example of it. You basically get the data and you put it either here or here. Right? So now you have flexibility in selection. So let's take a look at that over here. Yeah, basically this is 16 flit FIFO buffers. You divide it into 16 flit four lane buffers. And this way you have flexibility. One of them may be requesting output port one, another may be requesting output two, another may be requesting output three. Now you can actually distribute them. Uh, it's a limited form of out of order execution. Actually, if you know the idea of clustering the execution engine, that's essentially what's happening here. The, the, this is a FIFO queue. You could make it an out of order queue, but limited, this is, you could also turn it into four FIFO queues, right? Where you just look at the heads. That's the idea. Okay, if we, if we do the same simulation over here, here we'll block by other packets, we cannot move. But now we have two channels over here, uh, two, uh, two virtual channels, as you can see. So the blue ones are blocked over here because they cannot go anymore. But now red ones can proceed because you have another thing over here. Now that's the idea. So these are the virtual channel buffers. The input channel gets divided into multiple FIFO queues, and those multiple FIFO queues arbitrate in this input channel and you have many other input channels, let's say four inputs. If, if, if you have a mesh, you have five inputs and five outputs, right? Including the local node. Uh, but if you exclude the local node, you have four inputs and four outputs over here. Okay, so now we're, make, we're making the router more complicated, as you can see. And this is, this is actually what a modern virtual channel-based router looks like. You have a lot of these routing uh, uh, buffers. And how do you size the buffers is another question, actually, that we didn't really handle so far. Okay, there are other uses of virtual channels. These are virtual channels are actually uh, other FIFO buffers. It's good to have them. You can avoid deadlocks. You can, for example, enforce uh, switching to a different set of virtual channels uh, on some turns that can break the cyclic dependency of resources. This gives you some freedom in your routing algorithm design. You can enforce order on the virtual channels. You can have escape virtual channels, have at least one virtual channel that uses deadlock free routing, and everything else can use deadlock not free routing. And of course, it's more complicated, it's heterogeneous, and you can ensure each flit has fair access to that VC. How do you do that? You can also have uh, handle protocol level deadlock, the standard deadlock that's higher level. Basically, uh, you, can, you can have address and data packets that go through different uh, mm, virtual channels. As a result, you can prevent cycles due to intermixing of different packet classes because your control packet may, stuck be, may be stuck behind some data packet, and that may actually lead to a deadlock, which we will talk about later on. Uh, I think we may talk about later on. And you want to avoid that by sending them through different virtual channels. It could enable also prioritization of different traffic classes like some quality of service mechanisms. Some virtual channels that can have higher priority than the others and you can inject into them uh, to, to get uh, better performance, or be better quality of service. So okay, this is the review of flow control, this is forward and forward, not a good idea. As you can see, it's slow. You can shrink the buffers and reduce latency and that leads to wormhole routing. And yeah, head of line blocking, and you get rid of head of line blocking by actually turning this into uh, a virtual channel based router. Okay, okay, so buffers actually cause other headaches. <laughs> uh, 
in addition to virtual channels. So we didn't even talk about buffer sizing, but there's a lot of issues in buffer sizing and how many virtual channels should you have, blah, blah, dot, dot, dot. That, that actually affects a lot of your complexity in the router. So communicating buffer availability is also important, right? If, if you're this router, you want to send a packet to an output port, this other router, an output port, let's say south output port, can you send that packet? That's the first question. Because does it have enough buffering available? How do you communicate that availability? If you have buffers, you have these headaches. So a credit-based flow control means upstream router knows how many buffers are available downstream, and downstream passes back credits to upstream saying you can send me four at most. And everybody does the bean counting, and there's a lot of signaling that happens basically between the two routers. So you need to have a separate network to actually send these credits. You cannot route them in the same network because you run into a lot of other issues if you route them in the same network. Not good. <laughs> so there are other methods that are developed. It's not the only method, but this is the commonly used method. Uh, you can have on and off flow control. Basically, downstream has a single bit saying, you can send me or you cannot send me. Of course, if you have this sort of thing, now you need to be conservative because you need to ensure that uh, the other uh, router didn't start sending you uh, the, uh, the buffer, the thing that you cannot buffer, right? Which means that you need to have uh, a lag over here, and that determines, that determines either your buffer size or how, how long before you send this message. Regardless, you have some underutilization of buffers because of the signaling. Or you could do ACNAC control flow. This is actually best for utilization for the buffers, but it's basically upstream optimistically sends the packet to downstream. And buffer cannot be deallocated until the ACK or NAC is received. It's good in some sense. You can, you can NAC it, but it, it inefficiently utilizes the buffer space because you cannot deallocate the buffer here. Right? So none of these are actually very uh, happy <laughs> if you really want to optimize something. OK, so a credit-based flow control, uh, this is actually, this, this leads to delays, basically. Uh, basically, in this node, split the parser router, you send the credit, there's some time delay over here. Now this process is the credit, and then it can send the flit. And then this process, and then uh, basically this is called the credit round trip delay. And it takes a long time to communicate these credits. You don't need to, go, you can go over this to convince yourself that it's not. Basically it's the time between when buffer empties and then when the next split can be processed from that buffer entry. As you can see, the buffer empties over here, but you can only receive an next split after, at this point, and, that's, and this is your credit round trip delay. And that determines your buffer sizing. Uh, and it leads to significant throughput degradation if there are a few buffers, so you need to size your buffers to ensure that that credit turnaround time is taken into account, and that leads to big buffers, basically. Even though you could have get, gotten away with small buffers, this overhead of managing the buffers actually lead to big buffers. This is another example, on and off flow control. You send the flit. You basically have a threshold that says, okay, don't send me anymore even though you may actually have buffers. And this is basically what happens. Yeah, and then it stops itself. There's a processing delay over here also. So you need to, send, you need to size the buffers such that you uh, take into account this uh, communication latency between the routers. Right. OK. And now you can turn it on after, after some point, as you can see. So it's kind of obvious here. Basically, you set the on and off threshold such that you don't run out of buffers. And that leads to a buffer uh, explosion again. OK, so I, I think enough of that buffering. I covered that very fast. But hopefully, the fundamental concepts are very simple and clear. So let's talk about performance a little bit. Uh, basically, this is a very classic curve. It's actually it's called the load latency curve. This is the load or injection rate into the network. How much load, how much pressure are you putting on your network? And how are the latencies looking? And usually the curve looks like this. You keep injecting into the network, your latency starts shooting up after some point. Uh, this is actually very fundamental, I think. <laughs> Whatever you, whenever you inject a lot of work somewhere, you might expect the latencies go up. Right? That's true for humans also, I think. OK, so basically, how is this determined? So there is a minimum latency that's determined by the topology over here. You cannot cross that. That's why your topology is important. So if you want to minimize your latency, you start with a good topology. There is a minimum latency given by a routing algorithm. You cannot cross that because routing algorithm needs to make decisions, and it, it basically has a minimum latency. You cannot cross that also. So that's why it's important to design a good routing algorithm. 
And there is a zero load latency that's also determined by your flow control, all of that buffer management, for example, if you're doing buffering. And this is called the zero load latency. That's how you get to that zero load latency. If you don't have any load, that's the minimum latency that you can achieve. You don't inject into the network, basically. That's the minimum latency. And that's called zero load latency over here. OK, this is the latency aspect. There's also the throughput aspect. There's some throughput that bandwidth you can sustain. And there is a maximum that you can get from your topology. That's why your topology is, again, important. Again, there is a maximum that your routing algorithm on a given topology can exploit. If you're using XY routing on a mesh, you're not exploiting full your, all of your bandwidth. As a result, your maximum bandwidth goes that way. And there is also inefficiencies in your flow control, because of what we just discussed, that get you over here. And that's all, that's, this, is, this place over here is called your saturation throughput. Yes, you can achieve it, but you saturate at that point. Ideally, you don't want to be in this part of the curve. You want to be somewhere over here in the curve, perhaps. Right. So we actually, as we discussed, we were discussing source throttling. What source throttling does is, basically, if you're over here, it's moving your injection rate down so that you get somewhere over here. That's the idea. So you can apply source throttling to the networks also. So I think this is very fundamental. It, it's very much affected by all of your design choices in the network, as you can see. So ideal latency is solely due to the wire delay between source and destination. So certainly there's uh, a distance that you have. And Manhattan distance is because of the Manhattan Street network, it's like Manhattan. Uh, you have the distance between two points measured along axes at right angles. Uh, and you have a propagation velocity. So ideal is basically that distance divided by that velocity plus the packet size and the channel bandwidth because that takes some time also. Actual latency is actually much worse because you don't have dedicated wiring. You have long wires segmented with the insertion of routers. And your actual latency looks like this. Basically, you have number of hops plus the router latency plus the latency due to contention. So you, you basically add up, in addition to this ideal latency, you have more latency on top of this. So latency throughput curve looks like this, basically. Ideally, you would like this. But in a real network, it's a on chip, but it doesn't matter. You get that. OK, so basically, network performance metrics, uh, people measure packet latency, round trip latency, and saturation throughput. Saturation throughput is this one. Packet latency is wherever you are over here. And people draw these curves, but usually these curves actually don't take into account uh, the performance. Uh, they don't take into account the application level performance. Basically, your system performance is affected by interference among threads and applications. OK, so this takes us to some interesting ideas. But this also makes us run out of time. Any questions so far? I've given you the basics of interconnection networks. Now you probably know everything about interconnection networks. Yes? I didn't, uh, net, not, not network design, network designers. I don't know, ask them. <laughs> I think maybe it's the. That's right. That's right, yes. So basically, uh, you don't need to reorder the data, right? Data can be stored somewhere else. Uh, you just do the control reordering.
Yeah. So basically, the I, I, I think the real answer is really complexity, right? If you do full out of order scheduling, it's complex. No question about that. We know that really well. But I think there is also another answer, which is really the mindset. <laughs> I think people started with these FIFO queues, and they started with that mindset going, OK, how can we make this FIFO queue work a little bit better without increasing the complexity a lot? There's no fundamental reason to not do out of order scheduling. We can do it, right? I mean, we do, we do it at much, much higher speeds at the instruction level today, which means that it can be done. The question is, why is it not done? Uh, I think it's good to evaluate potential benefits of it. I'm not sure if anyone has done a very strong evaluation. So for example, this virtual channel flow control paper does some evaluation, but that's really old. So it may be good to reevaluate this. But I think I, I'm going to give you another answer. I want to get rid of buffering. <laughs> then you don't need to run into any of these headaches, right? How about that? Just get rid of buffers or have minimal amounts, and you use them only when you really need them. Why, why do you need to buffer everything that comes into your router? Right? What's the point? If you can just send the thing through, just send the thing through. Your goal is really to send the thing through in the end. Buffers are just there to, for management. So in a sense, the mentality is similar to processing in memory. right? Why do you need these buffers to process anything? Anyway, we're, we're getting ahead of ourselves. We could talk about that right now. What else? Should we go over here or should we start next tomorrow? Okay, let's do tomorrow then. Okay, I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>